Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome back to the uh, SSB uh, ground school for primary instruction. Uh, this is where we are uh, taking apart and, and analyzing and presenting on the FAA's glider flying handbook. Uh, the glider flying handbook is a wonderful document that was put together by uh, some of the best pilots in the country. Uh, and that was compiled and edited, edited and compiled by the FAA and they publish it. And the answers in it are the, the answers that we need to use uh, when we're taking our check ride. Uh, not only that, it's for by and large, you know, pretty much the, the correct way to do uh, uh, to, to, to fly gliders. And uh, it becomes the standard that we use in gliders when we're discussing you know, what kind of operations to use, what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, not everybody sees it the same way every time, but you can refer back to the glider flying handbook. Uh, and okay, maybe our field conditions are a little bit different. And, but you start with what it says in the glider flying handbook if you want to have a, a good glider operation. Uh, this this uh, series that goes through the the uh, glider flight handbook and presents the parts of it in hopefully a, a, a manner that we can all understand well. Um, it's being done by, it's been, the presenters are uh, two uh, CFIG candidates who are uh, Soaring Society of Boulder Club members. Uh, both are great pilots uh, and, uh, and both are, are glider positive. <laughs> and coincidentally, both were my my students to get their at glider add-ons. Both were uh, very accomplished commercial pilots uh, before they uh, got their glider add-on and uh, also flew uh, paras, uh, paragliders and, and other types of uh, devices like that where you can, uh, where you really have to learn how to, how to soar and how to uh, use thermals. So those, uh, those two gentlemen uh, who I mentioned who are these great pilots and and of the presenters, uh, Jeff Clayton, who is with us tonight, uh, and also uh, Casey Meeks. Uh, Casey just had back surgery. Uh, he was like bound and determined to be here tonight, but then uh, sent me a text message a few hours ago saying he just didn't feel up, which is of no surprise to me. So we're gonna give Casey the night off. Uh, Jeff uh, has got his presentations done. Uh, he may, uh, I don't know if he's going to add one or not, uh, and, um, but then also we're going to have a discussion. Uh, we're going to hold a little discussion here, maybe on, uh, if we have some extra time. But at any rate, let me turn it over to Jeff. Uh, Jeff uh, had a career in the U.S. Uh, Air Force, uh, primarily flying F-16. He got to fly them all over the world and, and uh, got to fly supersonic and all that. There's some good stories here. So uh, at any rate, uh, Jeff, I want to turn it over to you. Please, uh, please present what you're going to present tonight on the uh, Glider Flight Handbook. All right. You need to enable my sheen, screen sharing. And it we'll should see be on can... now. OK. Are you seeing my screen? No, sir. I want to go to this. Yeah, go. there you go. Yeah. I still haven't figured out how to get all you characters out of the view so I can read my own slides. All right. Go to the upper right hand corner where it says view and click on side by side speaker. See a hide non video participants. No, that doesn't work. Yeah, you can do that too. Let me try this one here. That works. Okay. Um, Is that good? All right. Now you're just seeing a slide, right? Yes, sir. And we good. see your, your good looking face next to it. But, well, true. Uh, yeah. I, I can't see any of you guys, but I'll pretend you're there. Yeah. Okay. So um, go I'm going to do, I'm gonna do two presentations tonight. Um, First one's gonna be on pre-flight and ground operations. Uh, I think another name for this could be 
checklist use and taking your time because that's going to be kind of the theme of everything. Um, there are some things I'm not going to cover, um, at least not in any kind of detail that are in the glider uh, handbook. And that's uh, self-launch gliders, winch towing, car towing, although a lot of this, the, the same concepts, the same things apply to them, but I'm not going to get into the details on that because I doubt any of you are going straight into that, and I'm not an expert on any of those. So here are the topics we'll cover. Um, you can look at those, and um, we'll just go through those in, in, in order. So starting with required documents, uh, those of you that are already aviators uh, might know this acronym, a good one to remember, AERO. And those are requirements in uh, aircraft, airworthiness certificate registration, required placards, which operating limitations uh, are a big one there, and weight and balance. Uh, interestingly, that does not cover another item that's required uh, according to 40, 14 CFR 91.9B. You're not op, uh, allowed to operate a, a uh, US registered civil aircraft if you don't have a flight manual on it. So really, I think that should be considered a, a, a fifth in there. And uh, of course we have it in our glider gliders. Uh, another thing I think the key uh, point on this, and this kind of gets to the heart of why we need to make sure we do good pre-flights, not just from a safety standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, civil air, aircraft airworthiness, you cannot operate an aircraft unless it's airworthy condition. So it puts the, the big onus on the, the operator of that aircraft, the pilot in command. And you are uh, responsible for determining that that aircraft is, is in a condition for safe flight. So basically, you know, it's a club aircraft maybe, but it's your responsibility from a regulatory standpoint to make sure that that aircraft is good to go. Glider uh, flight manual, also often known as a pilot operating handbook, especially in powered circles. Um, you want to be very familiar with this, so all the uh, chapters in there, the, uh, the sections that we're going to primarily, uh, that are you know, the focus of pre-flight and ground ops are normal procedures and chapter eight, handling service and maintenance. Uh, interestingly, um, they're often uh, covered in uh, section four or even in section five. I, I guess that's just the... I don't know, foreign companies, maybe they just play by their own rules. They're generally set up the way the FAA has it. Emergency procedures will be chapter three. Normal procedures will be chapter four. But a lot of the uh, handling service and maintenance type of stuff I uh, notice is in chapter five in, in the, the gliders that we fly. All right, uh, pre-flight inspection. Um, normally, uh, it's going to be in your normal operating procedures, uh, chapter four. And we have in our gliders, and it's a good idea if you ever have your own ship to have a, you know, a small laminated, you know, durable version of that in the cockpit. If any of you that have Armin as an instructor know probably the very first thing. I remember walking out to the ship with him is he goes, what's the first thing we look at? And I'm getting ready to say, you know, the wings are on or something like that. And no, you find the checklist. So the key point, again, use the checklist um for getting your aircraft ready to fly before launching so forth uh, another thing i would say is is don't allow distractions so uh, you know pre-flighting the aircraft is is serious business uh it's how you're making sure that you have a, a an aircraft that's airworthy it's not going to let you down so don't allow distractions and if you do get distracted have a, a procedure where you can go back and and start where you uh, had left off or maybe even a step before that to make sure you didn't miss that. Um, <clears throat> Pre-flight inspections, uh, pretty simple on a glider. I mean, very simple <laughs> compared to some of the aircraft I've flown. Um, and they're designed to have a flow. And generally they'll start in the cockpit. Um, a lot of the things that you're gonna find in a checklist aren't gonna be fully what you're gonna wanna look at, you know, setting up your flight computer and maybe it won't talk you know about specifics that you are, are getting ready you know where you're going to put your maps where you're going to put your snacks your water or whatever but anyway the flow it usually has a flow you start with the cockpit 
uh, work around uh, the nose or the left wing, uh, around the left side of the, the uh, fuselage, uh, the tail, and onto the uh, right wing and the right side of the, of the aircraft. So if, if you're walking around the aircraft in that order, you're, you're probably going to hit all the points that are on there. There's just like a generic one, you know, every aircraft is going to probably be, uh, you know, fairly similar to this, especially when you're, you're talking about inspecting uh, for damage and control surfaces and so forth and so on. Uh, a thing that's not in any uh, pre-flight checklist, and it's never something that I've done in any other aircraft I've flown, is known as a positive control check or PCC. Um, this is, you know, something that I guess a lot of pilots do every flight. Some pilots don't, um, but it is an extremely good idea. You could almost just, just consider it mandatory to do any time after you rig the ship or put the ship back together again after having been trailered. Um, you're going to be checking the control surfaces primarily, uh, aileron, spoiler, elevator, and rudder and uh, two person type operation. You have one person moving the, uh, the control surface um, and then uh, another person putting pressure against that surface so that we can make sure that there's no, no slop, no binding, you know, that something doesn't just go snap, pop, whatever. Um, and that you have full movement of the controls and uh, with the spoilers that you're making sure that the uh, spoiler box is clear debris. And I have on a, uh, when I was doing a, a PCC with somebody, looking in their spoiler box, found a uh, about a quarter inch pebble in there once. So uh, I think that was Casey actually. And so um, it it happens, you know. There's there's a good reason for it. And I think Jason, who I think is on, uh, was doing the uh, PCC today and noticed a little bit of slop in the uh, the elevator. I guess determined it was airworthy, but uh, there's good reason to do it and especially uh, because uh, if you've put together the glider, rigged the glider, it is a almost surefire way to make sure that everything got hooked up correctly. <clears throat> um, okay, ground movement. Uh, you know, gliders, big long wings, so they're bulky, unwieldy, you know, with only uh, usually two wheels. And they're also fragile, you know, they're composite, gel coat or, um, you know, just very uh, precise surfaces that we don't want to get scratches or dings into. So most of the time, uh, anytime you're moving it on the ground, unless you have specialized equipment, you're going to want to use um, two or more people, more if you have uh, any kind of windiness uh, to try to avoid damage. Um, primarily, you're going to be, probably have, if you have uh, two people, you're going to have one person on the wing and one person in a position where they can either pull or push depending upon uh, you know what direction they're they're going with the glider and also be kind of the the person that determines where it needs to be steered to key point do everything slowly haste makes waste uh some specialized gear that uh if, if you've been at you know at, uh, at ssb uh, you may or may not have seen um probably have seen a tow dolly there that we have hooked up and usually has a strap to it and that's how we can maneuver the aircraft around without you know scraping the uh, the tail wheel around um and then uh a, a wing uh wheel is a, a device that gets strapped to the wing and it basically just alleviates necessarily having a a person on the wing and if you're moving at long distances towing behind a car um as you see pictured here, uh, it's very handy to have a, a wing wheel. A tow bar, uh, simply device, and there's different types that hook up and they just basically hook up to the uh, tail dolly so that you can move it around with a, a vehicle or you can even just pull it manually. So those, those are some uh, additional aids to movement on the ground. So again, the, the key point is, is have enough people to handle the situation for wind and nearby objects and things like that so you don't ding a wing um and um just make sure you're doing it slowly and controlled
Um, <clears throat> so launch equipment, you're talking about uh, tow ropes and the uh, linkages you have there. There's lots of different materials that can be used for a, a tow rope. Um, we have at uh, Soaring Side of Boulder, and I believe uh, Mile High also uses polypropylene rope. There's all different sizes, strengths, wear, stretch characteristics of them. It's basically just a way to link a glider to a, to a tow plane. And there's two basic types of tow links that are used. The Schweizer, uh, which I don't think is used by either, I know it's not used by Soaring Society Boulder, and I don't believe it's used at all by uh, Mile High. At least I've never been hooked up to them. And Toast. So just uh, the different companies that make them. You can see the Schweizer is just a, a large, larger singular ring. And uh, the Toast has a, a double ring type of orientation. And they're, they're very specially manufactured, you know, with the way they weld them together um, on, on, on how those are, are made. And here's a little picture of how the, uh, the Schweizer hooks in and it's kind of a different type of uh, release mechanism. Um, this release mechanism, they, they pull this little lever back and then this thing falls down and it slides off. Whereas the toast is like a grasping type of thing and it just pops open. So the toast, uh, has less complications with the orientation of, of the uh, where the tow rope's being pulled than the, than the Schweizer does. This is less likely to fail to release than the Schweizer um, is. The uh, glider flight manual usually should have some uh, direction on what the rope strength needs to be and maybe what the, the length needs to be. But it's also in uh, the Federal Aviation Regulation 91.309, um, which dictates that the rope strength or weak link, if that's what you're using, is 80 to 200% of the maximum gross weight of the glider. So not the glider weight that you're going flying in, but the maximum gross weight that that system has to have, where it'll break somewhere between 80% and 200% of. Um, the weight of the glider, fully loaded glider. Uh, going back to the FARs, uh, the pilot in command determines the suitability, uh, length, you know, make sure that the rope is appropriate. Basically, the condition is the big thing you're going to be able to look at of the tow rope and the tow links. Um, yes, the tow pilot, having today been a newly minted tow, tow pilot, uh, is going to look over the rope and the links to make sure that they're good. But um, when you're the one being towed behind that glider, it's, it's up, or behind that tow plane, it's up to you to determine if it's suitable for, for operation. So if you don't, if you see something you don't like, then, uh, then turn it down. Um, there's a great SSB video on, on tow rope, everything, you know, the different designs of it, um, and some really useful and inf interesting information on how the tow rope weakens and, and where it's likely to break and, and certain things. And one thing that we we learned at SSB is to never go, oh, the knot looks like it's getting chintzy, cut the rope, tie a new, new knot, because what you're doing there is you're decreasing. The knot already is your weak point on the rope. And if you retie it, you're decreasing it by the percentage that the rope is already worn out. So if the rope has lost half its strength, you're then decreasing that weak leak strength by even more. So um, Armin has some personal experience with that. Another thing that we, we learned is that these rings can wear out. Are you gonna be able to tell that uh, as a pilot when, when the wing runner shows you the, uh, the, 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 the links and the rope? Probably not. So it's uh, incumbent upon uh, you know, whatever organization is doing the towing to make sure that those uh, metal rings aren't uh, wearing out to the point where, um, well, what happens with them is that they'll, they'll actually prematurely release. So they'll, they'll, if the release isn't really tight, they'll actually pull their, their way out and that's how it'll, it'll, you'll get a, a premature tow termination. Okay, let's see, I have anything else I wanna do? Yeah, and you know, um... If I can just add, I think you have it on your slide here, Jeff. 
uh, there's a video on the on the rope. Uh, right. That Mike Exner did. And right. Mike Exner, if if I could pick anybody who I knew uh, to be like the engineer, what should be in our rope, I would pick Mike Exner. Uh, he very smart guy, terrific uh, engineer, and um, he did. He, there's a video on the SSB YouTube channel talks all about our rope, um, what went on to choose it. Uh, you know, and, and and I've been asked about this rope, you know, it is a common rope, uh, but it's one that we've selected very carefully. But it's it's a common rope, it's selected, uh, both uh, SSB and Mile High Gliding use the same rope. And we've had a lot of experience with it. Um, I've had uh, several rope breaks that I've been involved with, and every time we had, a, I've had a rope break, it should have broken. And you got to remember these ropes; they do need to break uh, if things really go wrong. And what you don't want is you don't want to pull part of the glide, you know, pull the ring off the glider, or you know, the the, the hook off the glider, uh, pull the nose off the glider. Uh, you want that rope to break if it needs to break. Sorry if I overdid it. Jeff, please proceed. Oh, no, and, and I'll add to that, um, you know, if you go some other place, like Armin and I both were at a regional contest in Nephi, Utah, you know, they're going to have their equipment out there, and I was watching them assemble. They were doing some kind of splicing thing that I guess basically created a weak link within the rope instead of, uh, kind of like what you see here, instead of having a knot, they kind of somehow spliced it together so um you know there's a lot of unknowns as as the, as the pilot command that you're you're you are entrusting someone else on it but you know use your best judgment if it just looks really bad reject it you know what the worst happens is you don't fly okay on to uh pre-takeoff checklist again Big thing, use the checklist. Don't get rushed. Um, you know, don't get uh, distracted. It's a, a critical phase of flight. It's a, um, you know, basically you, you don't, this is not the time to be chit chatting about things um, because this is your last chance before you take off to make sure that everything is, is right. Um, Again, glider flight manual chapter four is where you're going to find uh, this. And you're also going to find usually, and if you have your own glider, you should post it somewhere either on your instrument panel in front of you or on the sidewall but below the canopy. This one here is actually taken from um, our discus uh, checklist here. And it, it's, it's a lot of, you know, obvious stuff, but stuff that could easily be missed you know if you don't personally take off your dolly uh, tail dolly and you're in a rush and that tail dolly's on there you know, have a very bad day um always important in the glider know where the winds are you know another one last chance to check your controls trim if your trim isn't set right that can make for a disastrous takeoff or or worse i mean you could you could end up causing a tow plane to crash and we'll talk about that in the next uh presentation if your trim is bad so just a lot of, of, of things um, that uh, you need to go through. And I guess a highlight of, of this also will be emergencies. And um, again, we'll talk about it in the next section, but to go through in your head, okay, if this happens, what am I going to do? You know, critical, time-sensitive type of things on takeoff. Same thing on uh, landing, um, you know, making sure that you, your gear are down. Um, if you're carrying water in your ship that you had dumped that, um, checking your spoilers, um, what speeds you're going to fly. So just really important stuff. This is a, a more of a generic one uh, out of the, uh, the handbook. Um, they like to use acronyms. I personally just like to have something printed that I can look at. Armand, I believe you have an acronym that you uh, use for when you come into land. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... You know, it starts out as U stall, which is pretty easy to remember. Uh, but then you have to put wind and water really first. So it becomes Wu stall, W W 
use stall. So wind, wind water, undercarriage, speed trim, air brake, look land. Um, I've always been a, you know, a strong believer through my military career and otherwise to actually have something I look at instead of just a memory uh, couch, but that's personal preference. Point is, is use, use a checklist of some sort and uh, you use it before you uh, take off. All right, on to a post flight. So we've come down, we've landed uh, and we're remaining rigged or we also would known as, as tying it out. Um, you know, at SSB we have set tie downs, but there are portable style that you can uh, put into the ground. Um, it's a good idea to have a, some kind of a tie out kit if you are a cross country pilot or an aspiring cross country pilot because you land someplace in a field, you still wanna be able to tie down your glider so it doesn't get blown around. So again, safely ground handle your, your aircraft to your tie down spot. So kind of the same thing as, as when you're pushing out to launch is you wanna get the aircraft back safely and ex expeditiously. So having helpers and equipment ready is a good idea. Um, you know, gliders are you know, very finely crafted wings. So wiping down the wings is a good idea. Inspecting for damage. I think post-flight is a good idea after every flight, just to make sure that all the pieces and parts are right and um, you know, no dings in the aircraft and it's good to go. Um, there's a checklist for securing the cockpit and a checklist for securing the glider. Use the checklist. Uh, some things to make sure uh, uh, that you put uh, your pedo covers on, um, that uh, your cover, your surfaces are covered up. Um, good idea to have a, a rudder gust lock of some sort on the aircraft. And just technique wise, uh, we're tying down the wings to have upwind wing. What do you think is going to at least be upwind for uh, the known wind slightly down? And nail, uh, tail and nose, uh, at least one, one or the other always. Uh, you might be in a situation like we were tying down at uh, Salida last week and, and it was not always possible to tie four points down, but always make sure that you have either the nose or the tail and uh, um, the wings. Wingspan stand can come handy for this too if you're on an aircraft ramp to not have the wing all the way to the ground, but to actually use a wing stand and then tie down from the, uh, the tip down to a tie down. And then on the other side, it will just stay up. All right, so if, if you're uh, putting the ship away, it's known as de-rigging. Uh, if you're taking the ship out of the trailer, it's known as rigging. Use the checklist, always, always, always use the checklist. Same thing on, on distractions. Distractions might cause you to miss something or do something out of order or you know not having something in the right place and ding, ding a wingtip. Uh, rigging and de-rigging is a, a fine opportunity to damage your glider. I, I think probably every personal glider owner has, especially when they were new to it, done something silly and ended up uh you know not strapped something down right or you know tried to, to take something out and banged it against something uh because they weren't taking their time or being careful enough you know almost always you're going to want to have two people there are these uh self-rigger devices this is, has a picture of one right here that can uh help you uh move wings around without uh Having a second person, but especially on on a bigger ship, on a you know an eighteen meter or twenty meter, you want to have multiple people. And on our uh, DG five hundred five, it's pretty much four people to put that thing or take it out of the uh, out of the trailer. Clear the area. Make sure that you're not going to bang the wings into anything or trip over something. Prepping the trailer again. This is this is all in the checklist, but. Uh, or make sure you do it. Inventory your items. Uh, make sure that you have the things you need in order to uh, to do it without damaging anything and to get everything to go to, together right. Do it very methodically. Your positioning and uh, making sure that your uh, your assembly order is is correct. One of the things that the uh, 
handbook talks about is a critical assembly checklist. I haven't seen that in any of our glider manuals, but it boils down to um, once the aircraft is put together, there are certain items that they want to make sure that you check. Um, it's probably going to be, you know, things like wing spar connections um, and, and fittings and control linkage fittings and things like that. And again, the pilot in command is directly responsible and the final authority for the operation of the aircraft. So that goes to the rigging and de-rigging being done properly. The Soaring Society of America came out with a safety advisory on the glider critical assembly procedures. And they recognized four factors that frequently appeared when investigation accidents were made. And I believe this was the evolution of where there weren't a lot of standardized uh, um, parts on gliders. And so there was oddball ways that gliders were put together. And there were a lot of accidents that were being as a result of things not being assembled correctly. So they came out with this, uh, this advisory and they talked about the things and they're, I think, pretty self-evident. Distractions from other people while assembling gliders, failure to follow the uh, assembly procedures, failure to do a positive control check and rushing to get into the air. So if you hadn't seen a glider in a trailer, here's kind of how everything has its place, pads everywhere. It's really quite a sight to see. There's a lot of neat engineering that goes into how to tuck a glider into a trailer. If I may add something here, can you go back a moment? Sure. Um, I really want to emphasize to everyone this, uh, when, when somebody is rigging and you see somebody rigging a glider, they're pulling their glider out of the trailer. Uh, you know, especially for new pilots, uh, it's like, well, that's kind of a really exciting and interesting thing. And I want to learn more about gliders. And so what happens uh, is that pilot tends to get a lot of, attract a lot of interest. And so people come up and they want to talk. That is a really dangerous thing to do. And if you really do want to watch, and, and you should, and, and I'm sure you do, and, and the students here, uh, and you want to watch, um, do that stand away if he looks at you and says hey can you help me with this wing tip i want you to grab it over here by all means do that uh but don't do anything unless you're invited uh to assist because otherwise um yeah that this distraction while assembling a glider is really a big uh a big issue a big safety issue so i hope you all do get involved, but do not uh, disrupt the, the pilot who's, who's assembling. I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Jeff. Please proceed. Good point. Yep. So the, this, uh, again, is the items uh, that they, they highlight in the uh, safety advisory. Um, it's a lot of just connections, if you look at it, how things are connected. I took this picture out of the, the ASK-21, since that's a glider that maybe all of you are familiar with. And, you know, and, and this is, again, is something that we learn early on to, to do on our pre-flight, but, uh, you know, this is just one of those fittings. This is the, I don't even know how you say this, French word, le hauteur, le hauteur fitting. Um, but, I say uh, le hauteur. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't really know. It, it, it is a, it's a French name, obviously. Right. One of my cousins figured this out. Uh, boy, boy, yeah, I don't want to try to say it. Anyway, uh, anyway the, the, import, the important thing is, is that there are some pretty nifty fittings that go on on these gliders and the way things are hooked together. And, and there's, you know, always a safety, um, you know, a way to tell that it's safety, safely put together. So, you know, they talk about it here in the ASK-21. Not a glider we take apart very often because we don't have a trailer for that one. Okay, glider care. Um, care for your glider, it'll care for you. But some of these things, you know, like surface wipe down, uh, it's good to do right after the flight so that uh, those bugs that smashed against it aren't dried on, it's baked on. Use just a water and a rag. Um, and you will get better aerodynamics. Uh, you go to any competition and you will see 
all those competition pilots very carefully cleaning down their, their glider after flight. Canopy, um, take care of the canopy. Uh, cover it whenever possible. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is to protect the canopy itself, but also sunlight coming in and, and damaging instrumentation in the cockpit. Um, I will say that particularly canopies that hinge, uh, don't hinge the side, that hitch, hinge up and down, if the sun's coming uh, at an angle where it will reflect off of that canopy, it can actually start a, a, a fire in the, uh, the aircraft. So another really good reason to cover the uh, canopy or at least have it, it, it down, uh, not just leave it up even for a short amount of time. Um, and never just rub a canopy with just a rag. Always, you know, the best thing is really just to rinse it off and not rub it with anything, but you know, inevitably it's going to get fingerprints and things like that on it. So use a good glass cleaner and, and just, you know, uh, rub the rag in, in one direction. Don't do a like buffing action on the, uh, the canopy. Uh, covers and control locks, uh, you know, to protect it from, from the wind and the sun. Uh, obviously the ultimate is to put it into a trailer to protect it. Mylars, mylars are the, uh, the plastic pieces that go, uh, that, cover the, um, the hinging point on the control source. So, so like on the ailerons, on the uh, rudder and on the elevator. And they are, uh, they are really important for the aerodynamics of the aircraft. Um, so we wanna make sure we take yeah. care of those. Go, go ahead. Yeah, right. sure. Um, gap tape, uh, that is, you know, the, the simple electrical looking tape that, uh, and we don't want to have that start peeling off. So if, if, you know, it's a good thing to check on the pre-flight, but on the post-flight also check it and see if it's coming off and, and replace it. It's not hard. And that's just what seals the gaps, you know, all those, the wings and the, uh, um, mostly the wings to the fuselage and uh, winglets and uh, sometimes between the, uh, the vertical and the horizontal tail, there's going to be gaps that we want to tape up to make it more dynamic and we don't want that tape streaming off in the air if nothing else it makes an annoying howl and uh gel coat slash polyurethane finish uh take a good look at the glider hand man uh flight manual on uh you know how to how to take care of those uh if you have the opportunity join a uh ssb work party uh where we uh you know, refit, we've uh, not refinished, but re-wax uh, the wings or redo mylars. You learn a lot about glider care from that. Uh, so, unless you're helping out the, the club. Preventative maintenance, uh, the federal aviation rec regulations dictate what can be done by the owner operator on a cer certificated aircraft. Um, and that's found in appendix A to part 43 for major alterations, major repair, and preventative maintenance. Uh, maintenance on experimental aircraft is not restricted under part 43. So, you know, our, our discus aircraft are experimental. Uh, I'm not sure if the 505 is or not. Um, but in any case, if you're gonna do anything more than these preventative maintenance type of items, it's a really good idea, uh, A, the ship manager should be the one that's dictating what's going to be done, but the ship manager will probably consult a, a, uh, an A and P mechanic if there's if there's something in question. So preventative maintenance, what does that mean? Basic non-structural repairs, lubrication, hydraulic servicing, tire replacement, upholstery. Um, it can also mean you know a, a chip on the on a surface or something like that. But it's a real good idea to consult uh, an expert in fiberglass surface repair before doing any of that type of uh, work or maybe just have them do it. And here's the laundry list of things that are actually included under that part 43, if you wanna look through it sometime. There's, there's things on there that kind of surprised me that you, you can do, um, you know, like replacing safety belts and such, but it's, it's more or less, so just making sure that you're not doing anything that's gonna compromise the structure or the aerodynamics of the aircraft. My final thought on this, take care of the glider and it will take care of you. Any comments or questions?
You know, Jeff, I, I would just add one thing. Um, and, and there is almost, no, these gliders, when they're in the air, there is almost nothing that you can do to hurt them. Um, you go through rough air and all that, they're made, they can take that. That's, that doesn't hurt them. Um, the only play, you know, I guess you can overspeed them and get into flutter, or you could possibly overstress them in a tight turn. But those are things that you got to really be trying hard to, to, to do something bad. On the ground, there's a million ways you can damage the glider. There's ways that haven't even been thought of yet that you can damage that glider. That glider is a, a very cumbersome thing on the ground uh, that's very prone to gusts, uh, that's prone to uh, just you know inappropriate handling, uh, putting it in the trailer. Uh, there, there's a thing that we call it's called trailer rash, and you know uh, just maybe John, maybe John. Uh, there's maybe a couple people uh, that that are exempt from that, but they've probably had gliders before that have had trailer rash. Um, so there's just a lot of ways you can hurt that glider on the ground. Uh, unlike when it's in the air, it's it's there's really not much you can do. It's a great thing in the air. It's a very graceful, wonderful thing in the air. On the ground, man, it's it's terrible. So, Jeff, thanks for giving us that. Uh, overview on, on pre-flight and ground handling. Ground handling is a big part of, it's not the most fun part of soaring, but it's a very, very important part. So thanks, Jeff, and please proceed. All right. Uh, my next topic is uh, abnormal and emergency procedures. The picture on here is kind of near and dear to me because it's from an F-16 checklist um, on all the bad things that can happen, what to do to fix them. So we all know who he is, right? Everyone know what, what this is from? Yeah, that's Sully. Well, on the left there, that's Sully. Yeah. 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 And this, and this, is the movie, this is yeah, a movie airplane. The guy from Airplane. Yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, the first thing I looked at when, uh, uh, you know, is looking at this topic, abnormal and emergency procedures. So what's what's the, what is abnormal and what is emergency? So according to skybrary.arrow, I honestly don't know what their, their credentials are, but they looked pretty good on the Internet. An abnormal situation is one in which it is no longer possible to continue flight using normal procedures. The safety of the aircraft or persons on, on board or on the ground is not in danger. An emergency situation is basically where they are in danger. That's their definition. To me, abnormal means it's something that you need to deal with so it doesn't become an emergency. And an emergency is something you need to deal with now to prevent damage, injury, or death. So that's kind of my, um, my take on that. Uh, another thing I think about uh, when I think about especially emergencies is critical action procedures versus checklist procedures. And I define a, a critical action is, is you just have to not just know it, not being able to rattle it off, but able to do it almost uh, uh, subconsciously. So it has to be ingrained enough in your head that you're going to do it under stress. A checklist obviously is something that we've got a problem here. We need to get into, you know, some sort of a guide um, on on how to handle this. In the glider world, you know, it's mostly going to be things that are going bad are going to be you, you just need to do them right, and you're not going to be like consulting a checklist to see. You know, caveat to that is probably what would be if you owned a self-launch, if you have a motor glider there are going to be things that could, will not even just go wrong, but you have to be using the, the, the checklist for making sure that things don't go wrong. Uh, so the more sophisticated the aircraft, the more you're going to have actual checklists to deal with um, problems in the air. Another thing um, 
that, that uh, is kind of a, a, an aviation mantra. Aviate, navigate, communicate in that order. Um, it is critical in an emergency that the first thing that you do is fly the airplane. Uh, even if you're not necessarily flying it in the way to handle the emergency, you are still flying the aircraft. You don't forget about, I need to keep this aircraft upright, pointed the right, you know, so that it's not going to hit it, run into anything or stall or, or whatever the case is. And really anytime, that's the way you want to you want to look at flying. First thing I'm worried about is, is flying the aircraft. Okay, now where am I going? Okay, do I, do I need to talk to anybody? Again, in the glider world, communicates pretty low on on the, on that uh, order but you know in the pattern it, it's a case and and any instructor with a new student knows that you know any time that these also apply if you have a new student that does pretty decent in the pattern but hasn't done a lot of talking and then starts talking the aviating starts to to fall apart so that's a that's a kind of a mantra there aviate navigate communicate I also think of uh, you know handling uh, abnormal things and and uh, emergencies is you know you have the knowledge whether it, you know wrote, no, wrote knowledge yes to know you know what what to do but also you know trying to apply that to uh, you know the more complicated situations preparation that uh, you know that you're um, aircraft is actually ready to go, that your systems are ready to go, um, that you don't just kind of lead into a, an emergency. And, and, and pre-flighting your aircraft is a, is a good example of that. And practice um, that, you know, whether it's just thinking through how a, and, and a situation should be handled or um, doing it on, a, you know, Condor, you know, the, um, internet glider training uh, program. You want to minimize the chance of the problems happening and best deal with them when they do happen. So the glider flight manual or flight manual section three is emergency procedures. I think it's real important to understand that, like you know, earlier I said, get to know that, that manual really well. <clears throat> that section is by no means a comp comprehensive guide for emergencies. Uh, just looking through two of ours, the discus has three topics they cover in that. It's one page. They talk about spin recovery, great, that's good. Emergency exit, I had to get out of the aircraft in a hurry in the air. And what they call safety considerations, which um, were to me almost barely into the uh, abnormal situation type of thing. So they just, I don't know, they just threw in some things that I didn't even think were really related necessarily to emergency. The ASK 21 has five things there, um, you know, and, and flight and pre precipitation. Um, if you do cross country soaring in the mountains here, you're probably gonna end up in some precipitation. I've never, I guess it's abnormal, but it's pretty normal if you're, so the fact that they have that in the emergency section is me just saying that do not think that that's the all encompassing. Here's what I need to do if I have an emergency. And clearly you should be prepared for other situations. All right, back to the FARs because uh, the FAA always wants to have a way to, to hammer you, but also in this case, I think give you a lot of latitude. I think this is actually pretty well written or pretty, you know, pretty good thing for them to, to have stated that, you know, the pilot in command is directly responsible for final authority for the operation of the aircraft. That's the, okay, the onus is on you. In-flight emergency um, require, oops, requiring uh, immediate action, um, pilot command may deviate from any rule of this part to the extent required to meet that emergency. Basically it's saying, break every rule in the book. I mean, you, whatever the, the regulations say, if it's required to meet that emergency. So what they're saying is, is, is uh, you know, you having the authority to do what is necessary, e even if it's breaking, um, breaking the rules. Now, obviously they're gonna take a look at after the fact of, you know, did you do something that made you get into that emergency and then caused you to break those rules or 
did you break a rule that had nothing to do with your emergency? But I think that that's good to not have that burden on your back to know that, you know, whatever it is that you might have to do, you can do it. So here are the topics. I, I broke it into takeoff in flight and landing because I guess that's my military career. That's, you know, kind of the way they, they uh, break emergencies down. But, you know, a lot of these things, there's no, not a clear distinction between the two. You know, as you're taking off, obviously you're in flight. And, you know, when you're landing, you're in flight. But I'll break it down into these uh, topic areas um, that we'll talk about. So on to takeoff anomalies, as I would call them in emergencies, um, directional control and that, you know, we know there's yaw, pitch and roll are the three um, motions that we can do with a, an aircraft with our controls. And uh, if we have one of those uh, problems on, um, well, another thing is I, I kind of broke these down into what I call causes, factors and remedies. The cause is, you know, kind of like the proximate, what is the um, direct reason that this, you know, emergency or problem happened. Um, factors or, you know, things that could contribute to it or accentuate the uh, problem. And then remedies would be what I consider like the, the critical action procedures or, you know, where you need to use some aeronautical decision-making skills. So anyway, the primary problems, if we're having problems controlling the yaw, so the aircraft's, you know, hunting, going off, you know, moving off to the side on the, on the runway, or pitch, you know, we're doing this, maybe we're oscillating, hitting the ground, or, you know, just the air, and then roll, of course, you know, that we catch a wingtip or, um, you know, can't control roll. The primary cause of this um, is pilot-induced oscillations, which, um, if you're, if you're not a pilot, I guess the best way I would, I could think of it when I was thinking, well, when, when do you get into a situation like this in basic life? If you've ever been in a skid in a car, if you skid on a rain or a snow covered road, and then you control back, you know, and you, you'll see people, you know, and they slide the other way and then they correct and then they slide, you know, next thing you know, they're spinning down the road. So they're over, they're over correcting, over controlling. And it's, it's a common thing uh, for, for new pilots to do. Um, and uh, it's also, you know, there's some factors that can go into that. You know, if you have a strong crosswind, um, you know, the wing is gonna tend to wanna drag, the, the nose is gonna try to turn into the wind. And uh, another thing that can affect is uh, if you have a CG hooked uh, glider, it, can, it makes it more susceptible to that because it's not pulling the, the aircraft from the, Front, it's pulling it from basically the center of gravity of it. So it's going to make it less stable and gusts of winds. And, you know, since you're starting out your, your takeoff at slow speed, you're going to need more controls. And if you hold those in too long, now you may correct back. And now that you're going faster, you overcorrect. So basically it comes down to, you know, trying to mentally, you know, just force yourself to reduce the amount of control response you put in and, and wait for it to take effect and then make slower and slower, smaller and smaller, I guess is the bigger point, uh, movements uh, as, uh, you know, if the aircraft is, is out of position. Ultimately, though, um, you always have the option to, to re release. And, you know, the earlier you do that, the better. So if you feel like you're having increased trouble controlling the aircraft, you want to just pull the release and and just abort on the uh, on the runway. Premature tow termination. This is a very glider um, specific thing. Uh, PTT, it's known as. Uh, what could cause this? Well, you know, basically, it's you know, for whatever reason, you are disconnected from the the tow aircraft, unanticipated, uh, uh, you know, uncommanded. Uh, a rope break could cause that to happen, a tow hook failure, or it could be pilot error. Your tow pilot might mistakenly pull the release, or you might pull the release. Um, I think Armin may have a, a story on that, but uh, we'll defer that to later maybe. Um, some factors on this, uh, you know, what could cause this? Well, tow plane engine failure, or if they have directional control, 
uh, problems. Um, glider control problems, you know, your, your toe position. Um, uh, and we'll talk more about that specifically later. Um, winds, some other things to, to factor into that is uh, what, you know, what you're gonna do in that case is how high this happens. And it's, it's something that you, if you uh, are learning to fly a glider, you're going to practice. And, and at Soaring Society of Boulder, you'll probably get the opportunity to practice again on your uh, spring check. But the height that this that the you have a premature toe termination, the runway length uh, and environment, you know what are, what runways you have available, um, are there other aircraft on them, your experience, you know how long you've uh, been flying and how well you control the uh, the glider, how well the glider performs, and so forth, are all going to factor into what happens if we have a premature toe termination. Remedies, uh, best case uh, is that you can stop on the runway. So if, if you have a, a break um, or some reason release and you're either on the ground still or maybe shortly above and you've thought about how you're gonna handle that as part of your pre-takeoff checks, just stop on the runway. Um, if it's a little higher up, you may just end up having to land straight ahead. A lot of it's gonna depend upon what, um, alternate landing locations you have available, whether you're gonna be able to land off the airport or return to land at, at the airport. Um, here at Boulder, and I think typically 200 feet, AGL is considered the minimum height that you would want to return and land opposite direction on either the main runway or the glider runway. And uh, depending upon how far out, this happened, how high up you were, what the winds are. You may be able to fly a modified pattern to land the same direction you took off. Or you may be able, you know, depending on where you where, where it happened, just come back and fly a normal pattern. So it's a good idea to have in your mind what you're going to do for the various heights and locations that you may have a, a premature toe termination. I will add on to that, just not personal experience, but I have been towed cross country um, in a glider. And you should be constantly thinking about there because you're probably not up at normal soaring altitude where you would be in those locations as you're going from one point to another of uh, what, where you would go, you know, where you would land. And we'll talk a little more about that and when we talk about um, landing. Um, there's a Soaring Society of America webinar on takeoff dangers and how to avoid them. If you're interested in you know, premature toe termination and just a lot of the uh, other items uh, to think about on, on toe. And uh, there's a link that I put in there on that. I, I watched it, it was, it was pretty good. Um, canopy opening, uh, obviously this isn't necessarily just something that could happen on takeoff, but I think if your canopy were to come open, this would probably be the most likely location for it to happen um, because the cause is probably almost always going to be pilot error that you didn't latch the canopy. And so again, part of our pre-flight check is make sure that the canopy is latched. I mean, look at the, the lever, but also push up on the canopy frame to make sure that it's latched. Uh, you know, factors that would cause this, again, not using the checklist, being rushed. And uh, remedies, well, fly the airplane. The glider will fly without a canopy or with a canopy open, whatever state it happens to be in. And just continue to focus on flying the aircraft. And, you know, if you can, let the uh, tow pilot know. There's probably so much wind noise, you're gonna have a hard time doing that. But in any case, just get up to a sufficient altitude where you can release and, and come back and make as a normal landing as, as you possibly can. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot more drag, a lot of wind noise, you may be losing things in the cockpit. I, I don't have, uh, I've never talked to anybody that's had this experience, but the people that handle it is, you know, coolly and, and fly the aircraft are the ones that uh, 
make it back and, and don't have a, a, a problem. Um, all right, we'll move on to uh, in-flight anomalies slash emergencies, uh, tow issues. Um, <clears throat> slack line, slack line, uh, there's a picture over here developing, but that's just one way that can happen. But basically what it is, is this a lack of tension on the tow line. So basically where you get this bow bow or or um you know relaxed tension in in the tow line between the tow plane and the glider things that can cause this uh turbulence so the tow plane and the glider getting bounced around will often cause some slack in the line position error so in this case you know if you're cut too much to the inside you're, you're basically trying to cut off the tow plane and um, that'll develop a uh, slack tow plane could cause it <clears throat> i actually had a situation and it was on a cross-country uh tow uh where i asked the tow plane to slow down and he pulled that power back and uh you know glider's pretty efficient so immediately i had a whole bunch of slack in the line from that remedies for that um you know always realize that you can just release from them the tow plane if that slack is becoming excessive because what we don't want to have is it to loop around a wing of the glider um you know or for the you know there'd be so much slack that when the tension does come back it's going to either you know put the tow plane out of control or or break the line if it's not excessive you handle it early you know more of a, a you know handling the anomaly uh Reestablish tension gradually. And there's different methods. There's a lot of technique. And I imagine some of it is, is basically glider, you know, how, how your glider behaves, either uh, slipping the, the glider to create extra drag, partially deploying the speed brakes. That's one that I'm kind of cautious to use because it tends to be a lot or nothing type of thing. And just positioning the glider uh, differently. And, and your instructor, can show you uh, their techniques and best ways to do that. But the key is, is to, to not allow it to get excessive, to, to handle it before it gets bad. The more uh, dangerous, extremely dangerous uh, phenomenon that can happen is called kiting. And this is where the vertical position uh, of the glider behind the tow plane is too high. And what happens there is if, the glider goes up and it's pulling that tow rope on that tail up. It's forcing the nose of the tow plane down. And it very quickly can get to the point where the tow pilot has no ability with pull back stick to prevent the nose from continuing to push over. And obviously the, if this happens on takeoff, it can just be immediately disastrous uh, for the tow plane. So um, there are Two situations uh, where you should always immediately release from the uh, tow plane. Does anybody uh, want to tell me what those are? If you ever out of the tow plane. Right. And the other one? When the tow plane waggles its wings. Yeah, or tells you, you know. So oh, maybe, he, maybe he. Well, well, when the tow plane rocks well, its wings, rocks its wings, rocks right. its wings. Yeah, and when the, you know, for your check ride, if the if the if he has a, the tow pl pilot waggle his rudder, kind of going back and forth, slapping you in the face, don't release. That's check the glider. Right. And but the rocking of the wings. And you know, until you've seen wings rock, you really haven't seen it. You don't really know what it looks like. So uh, make sure your instructor does a wing rock, has the tow plane do a wing rock, and you see that before you take the check out. Right, exactly. So factors that you know cause this is, is inattention or distraction. When you are on tow, 
especially initially, but really consistently through the tow, um, your focus just needs to be on the tow plane, staying in position as best as you possibly can stay in position. Because it only takes a moment of, of inattention or distraction for your glider to pop up, pull the tail and tail plane up and the nose down and it's over. Um, one of the other things that could cause this if you don't check your trim. So if you had your trim set, um, well, either way, either full forward or full back, uh, obviously full back would make it tend to, to nose up, but even if you had it full forward, you might overcorrect and uh, tend to do that. So you want to have your trim set for a good, you know, takeoff position. Um, you know, turbulence could cause this. Again, you probably would have to be pretty inattentive for it to be that bad. Or even an inappropriate slack climb recovery, you know, if you pull up too high behind the uh, tow plane. Really, the remedy for this is release. Anything else is really unacceptable. If you lose sight of that tow plane, um, you need to release. And if you don't, he's probably going to, or she is going to probably release you <laughs> if they are quick enough to do that. Um, a release failure, uh, you know, this could be, well, it basically is a release failure mechanism. Um, so you, you pull the uh, release and, and nothing happens. Um, again, with that uh, um, Schweitzer mechanism, there are other, depending upon where the tow line is, uh, could cause it to fail because of it gets kind of locks the, the tow or the release from working properly. But with the toast, it's probably just, you know, something just plumb more out, spring broke or something like that. Um, a lack of tension, yeah, again, that's more of the, uh, the Schweizer than the, than the toast. I think the toast even with, with slack will, will release. It just has to have any pressure whatsoever on it. Remedies for this, uh, if you're in a two-place ship, try the rear cockpit, obviously keep trying. Um, to release, maybe you didn't pull it hard enough. Maybe it was just binding a little bit and you can get it to release. Tow plane obviously can, can operate a release. In this case, you're gonna have 200 feet of rope hanging from your glider. So big consideration, you know, as you're coming in on landing to make sure that uh, you don't catch that on something. Another option uh, is to try to break the line. You know, so that would be to deliberately put some slack into it and, and try to get a good yank on it. Um, I, you know, I don't have experience or know anybody, haven't heard of any cases of, of how, how this actually, you know, works in practice to try to break the, uh, the tow line if, if you had a release. Probably the scariest thing I can think is if you had to land with the tow plane, um, because this is a case where obviously you're gonna have a huge tendency to overrun the tow plane. So, you know, if you can't release um, and the tow plane can't release for some reason, uh, you're going to want to coordinate this really well and find a good long runway, maybe not landing at Boulder in that case, um, and coordinating that really well so that they roll out as long as possible so that you can kind of just be on the brakes and keeping that tension on the line. Uh, obviously not putting the tow plane. So you're going to try to, it's going to be a, basically like a formation landing 200 feet behind. So um, not, not a good situation if you can't get a release or, or break the line. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever happened in history that. Yeah. I've heard, I read I, some research and I've heard of it happening on a, um, a winch launch. So. Uh, okay. That's, that's different. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, it's just, what's the probability that the glider can't release? Well, it's pretty high. And then what's the probability at the same time that the glider hits that very rare time that it can't release, that the tow plane can't release? Right. Um, I, I don't know. I, and breaking the rope, by the way, isn't that hard? I have plenty of students who can show you how to do it. Okay. I, ha I haven't done that one yet, but I, yeah, I imagine. Uh, uh, you haven't, but uh, there, there are others who have. Okay. 
Okay, um, moving on to pilot loss of control. Um, probably the the biggest one, um, and and it is big for for gliders because we we turn a lot and we turn in turbulent air is spinning. Um, it's not a required maneuver for your uh, private or commercial, but it's probably a good thing to learn how to do and how to recover from. Um, basically, the cause of a spin is just that you have an asymmetrical or you could also call it uncoordinated stall. So one wing is more stalled than the other. And so the wing that is more stalled tends to go low and the wing that's less stalled is high and it puts you into a turning situation. Um, factors, slow and cross controlled. Um, you know, if you're thermaling, you're pretty slow. And if it's turbulent, you might get cross controlled or, you know, just too excited, might get cross controlled. And if you're low altitude and you get into spin, things can happen pretty quickly. Um, airframe issues, you know, if there's something wrong with the, the aircraft rigging or, or something like that, instead of just stalling it, it may go into a, a spin. Another big factor is aft center of gravity. That's why we always want to make sure our center of gravity is within limits. And as glider pilots, we tend, especially as we're more experienced, to want to fly with the center of gravity pretty far towards the aft and that putting you at more risk of going into a spin. It just makes the aircraft more spin prone. The remedy for this, uh, don't fly with your aft after the CG limits and until you get experience, probably keep it more towards the center. Um, probably never further aft than about 85% is a good rule of thumb. Keep the speed up in turbulence because obviously, you know, in turbulent air, the, you know, you're more likely to just stall. And if you're more likely to stall, you're more likely to spin and know your spin recovery. So this is one of those critical action procedure type of things. Uh, you know, every glider flight manual is going to tell you how to do it, but they're all going to be some close approximation of neutralizing the ailerons. So not doing anything that's going to tend to make the exacerbate the situation. Uh, rudder opposite, so hard opposite, whatever direction you're, you're rotating. And uh, when the rotation stops, neutralizing the rudder and going stick forward in a abrupt, but probably not too extreme, depending upon, again, your flight manual. And then, um, yeah, you're gonna, as soon as you break that stall, so you're, you're, it's almost gonna be the same time. So your, your rudder, as soon as your, your spinning stops, you're gonna push forward and that's gonna basically break the stall that you, you're, you're now in and quickly recover because your nose might be considerably down. So know, knowing the at least the procedures for a spin is a good idea because as glider pilots, it's not just you know traditionally in in, uh, in powered aviation, spins are uh, a major threat in the pattern, and they, they can be in a glider as well. But uh, flying gliders in, in thermals, uh, low to the ground, especially uh, we we know need to know how to recover from a spin. Graveyard spiral may, to the uninitiated, seem like a spin, but it's really quite different. So the cause of a graveyard spiral is that uh, in a steep um, bank angle, as you're um, pulling back on the stick, it's tending to make the, the turn tighter and tighter and tighter. The G's go up and up and up. And this is particularly gonna be the case if, if the nose is low. If your nose is up, you might have an accelerated stall and that would be that, you know, the, it just stops turning and, and mushes and I guess worst case goes into a spin. But if you're steep banked and your nose gets low, you don't have good control of what we call a lift vector um, and you're pulling back, uh, just like uh, we learned earlier, you know, your pitch, is actually a big part of your turn. So the steeper the bank, the more you're pulling back on the stick, the more you're actually tightening up that turn. So why would this happen? Well, disorientation or maybe just fixation on something, you know, like you're really trying to go tight in a thermal and you don't realize that you let your nose come down too low. 
And the, the, the recovery for it is actually quite simple. I mean, you're just gonna relax the back pressure on the stick, roll out, you don't even necessarily have to roll completely out, but depending upon how low your nose is, you, you may want to roll out and then, uh, you know, pull back on the stick once you've got a lot of that bank out to get the nose back under control. And you wanna watch the Gs and you wanna watch the speed, especially if, if the nose really was excessively low. But all that having said, I mean, the, the most likely situation you're gonna have this happen is if you maybe got stuck in the, sucked into the clouds, you know, or for some reason, and you just lose all situational awareness or positional awareness on that. Another thing that, that wasn't covered in there, but I, I thought about um, is extreme turbulence that could cause you to lose control. Um, you know, in turbulence where the aircraft basically, you know, well, first thing I ask is if you do find yourself in extreme turbulence, can anyone tell me what speed you should be flying? Bon, somebody should know what uh, what the limits are when you're in turbulence. What's on the airspeed indicator? You fly in the green. Right. Well, that's your normal operating limitations. But what is what is um, what does the flight manual say about? Um, speed that you fly that you won't do structural damage to the aircraft if you're in extreme gusts or move the controls abruptly. It's you want to fly below VA. That's, right. That's the right. Yeah, maneuvering, your, your maneuvering, maneuvering speed. Correct. So if you do find yourself in extreme turbulence, which could be uh, thermal, but in the case, my personal case, was um, my second flight in wave. And I got into, in, you know, flying from one part of uh, the primary wave into the secondary, or no, from the secondary towards the primary, I got into rotor and the glider is just jumping all over. Things are, are flying up in the cockpit. So first thing was to slow, slow down below VA, maneuvering speed. And the other thing I'll say about that is, is if you're in turbulence, it's so rough that you, you can't really control where the aircraft is going. You basically just want to set the controls and try to just maintain as close as you can to level flight. And you're not gonna be trying to, oh, this wing went down, I need to pick it up now. Again, you, 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 you'll be incapable if it's extreme or the type of turbulence you might find in rotor and doing that. If you're not doing that, yeah, you could break the aircraft if you're above, uh, VA, especially if you're, you're trying to maneuver the controls at the same time as the gusts are hitting you, or you, you could simply just lose lose control of the aircraft and, and end up in a spin or a, a spiral of some sort. So I just add that in there as personal experience. If you plan on flying in wave, you could end up in something that at least is approaching extreme turbulence. So know, know how to handle the aircraft if you're going to fly in wave. So let, let me ask a question here uh, of the group, not of you, Jeff. VA, the uh, maneuvering speed, where is that shown on the airspeed indicator? I want to hear one of the participants here. Richard, do you know? It's not. That's the right answer. Thank you, sir. Good answer. It is not shown on the airspeed indicator. Um, if it, it were to be, it, it would be, but it's not. Uh, I'd make the top of the green uh, that um, that number. I don't know why they don't do it that way. I'm sure there's some wonderful reason why they don't, but uh, if it were well, I, me, Yeah, I can tell you why they don't. It's because depending upon your weight, it changes. It changes. Uh, well, I, I'd put it at, I, then I'd do it at maximum gross weight and say that's the number. But um, yeah. yeah, that that's a good point, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, and I'll. But I'll it, it's, it's, Jeff. it's something. It's something that you know. Uh, if you ever read about somebody that's gotten into extreme turbulence, loss of control is a huge factor. Yes, you you can break the aircraft, but if, if you're fighting 
every gust and, and so forth, you actually can put the aircraft out of control. Um, so your best mm -hmm. case is, I won't say just to freeze the control, but just to, to do your best job of trying to keep the, the nose attitude somewhere around the horizon until you're, you're through it. And if it's the case of wave, it won't be but you know 30 seconds and you should be out of it. Unless you're flying along the, the axis of rotation and then that's really not good. You should know more about flying in wave so that you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's time to go back and land if you do that. Uh, good explanation, guys, thank you. All right, All right. Um, airframe malfunctions. The, the, uh, the, the handbook talks quite a bit about this. I don't know whether they consulted with test engineers. So I was a uh, functional check flight pilot for the Air Force. And so I, I had some things happen uh, in the F-16 that approximated some of this. But, uh, you know, there's just any number of reasons that you could have, you know, control problems, um, you know, that are airframe related. And they're also very, very rare. I would say the most likely situation, this would be if you didn't do a good positive control check and make sure that everything's hooked up. So most likely it's because something isn't hooked up uh, properly and, you know, popped out or, or, or something like that. You know, we're talking about things binding, locked or separate so control surfaces separated. Any, any of those things could cause, you know, a flight control malfunction. Um, improper rigging, didn't do a, pro, a positive control check. Icing, you know, it's possible that uh, I've talked to, I think it was Clemens, club president, that talked about uh, the valves on the uh, the water ballast and the aircraft leaking and water flowing down the wing to where the flap slash aileron junctions are and having to fight the controls and then breaking the ice on it. So and I guess in an extreme case, it could lock your control surfaces completely up. If you exceed your airframe limits, you know, any flutter could, you know, make a control surface fail. Uh, poor maintenance, you know, again, I think that's probably the least likely. These aircraft are pretty well designed, but it's possible that, you know, not doing good annuals or whatever, and something just isn't connected right anymore and pops off. I would say, in my mind, uh, usually it's going to result in a bailout, and hopefully you can fly the aircraft to a, a you know, a flight regime where it's easy to, easier to bail out. Um, there's always a possibility that you could do some sort of controllability check if you're high enough. So, you know, maybe the faster you fly, the better controllability it is. But as you get slower, it's a little more difficult. So you might sequentially slow down and, and make sure that, hey, I still have roll control or I still have yaw control or pitch control. So flight control surfaces, uh, you know, if your elevator were to have issues of binding or reduced uh, movement, the uh, again, this is not something I have any personal experience with or talked to anybody, but the handbook talks about using bank and yaw control to help um, your, so if I guess if you were pitching up, the more bank you put in, of course, you need more pitch to maintain level of flight. So if you had some kind of uncommanded pitch up, then rolling into some bank would tend to keep the nose down. And again, maybe using some rudder to try to help with that. Um, if you were, you know, any of these, if you're still on tow and able to control the aircraft at all, maybe trying to have a tow up to a height where you can bail out. The aileron problems, uh, you know, if only one aileron has failed, I could conceive that you might be able to get some kind of banking, um, depending upon how it's failed. Again, whether both failed or up or down, it's hard to say all the different possibilities that you could have. But remember that you have for roll, your ailerons obviously are primary, but you you can affect some bank by using. Uh, rudder because it's going to put more lift on the wing that yaws forward and you're going to tend to roll that wing that wing's going to tend to roll up uh rudder um 
if you have a rudder failure, you know, obviously you're going to have no ability to coordinate your turns. And if you have any kind of crosswinds, it's going to make it more difficult to maintain control. Might be able to land. That's more my subjective type of opinion on that, that a rudder failure might be the, the least if it was just failed so it didn't work. Now, if it's hard over one way or the other, I don't, I don't know. It's really hard to say. So my, I guess my, my point on any, if you have a control surface fail is you're gonna probably figure out pretty quickly whether you can control the aircraft. But then if you can, you wanna be at a safe altitude to determine, can I control it where I need to, where I could land it? You know, am I gonna have control of the speeds that I need to land at? And if not, then make a pretty hasty decision because you're gonna be coming down the whole time to, uh, to bail out. Secondary surfaces, your flaps or spoilers, uh, you know, big thing here is to try to get things symmetrical. Um, hopefully symmetrical in, if it's a case of spoilers, you can always do slip to land in that case to lose altitude. Good reason to keep practicing those from time to time. Um, but if you have one stuck up and one down, oh gosh, I don't know, the aircraft's probably gonna be yawing like crazy. Uh, if both are stuck out or that's the only way you can get them symmetrical, just realize your glide ratio is going to be horrendous. So, and it's going to be a very steep approach and probably very firm, firm landing. Um, landing gear um, failures. Uh, I can talk a little bit about this one. Uh, I had my first gear up landing in any aircraft at all um, when I was at Salida. Um, it was un unanticipated and it was more of a gear handle came out of the detent uh, failure. So the gear was down and then went up, but I've experienced it. And I can say that it makes a horrendous noise, but think first and foremost about keeping the wing tips up and just doing the best you can to control your, your um, direction down the runway if you have it. And, and don't worry too much about the aircraft. That's my personal advice on that. So if you have gear up situation, try to land on grass or as smooth a surface as possible and fly it on. Try not to hit on the tailwheel because it's probably going to be a less controlled type of landing. Obviously, if you can't put your landing gear up, it's really not an emergency at all. It's just something's wrong and, and obviously you need to have it uh, inspected after we land. All right, just some uh, systems type of failures, uh, water ballast, if you're flying with that, uh, you know, bad drain valves or icing. Icing is kind of a big one on that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not great if you can't dump your water because you're landing heavyweight, put a lot of stress on the airframe. Um, factors that could cause that, poor maintenance or, uh, or not putting any freeze into your uh, water that you're flying up at freezing altitudes. Uh, fly lower, might, might have some time to unfreeze it. Flying faster speeds, more if you have a differential, so one wing dumped and the other didn't type of thing, you're gonna have more control the faster you fly. If it was really bad, I don't, I don't you know, again, I don't, I'm not sure, but I guess you could have a, a situation where you need to bail out. And if you knew that you were really unbalanced, you'd probably wanna do some sort of controllability check up high before you even thought about coming in the land. And if you could not control that roll, it's probably gonna be, and it won't dump, it's probably gonna be time to, to bail out. O2 system failure uh, causes, you know, obviously leaks, didn't fill it up pre-flight. Uh, regulator failure. And our little regulators in our gliders, if the battery fails, then the regulator doesn't work anymore. Kind of a Bad fail safe design, in my opinion. Um, factors. Uh, you don't mean the regulator there. You, you're talking about the EDS. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. The regulator is a different device and it doesn't have any adjustment. It, it just right. steps down the Pre pressure. Previous to the ECS. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah you're talking about the, uh, the uh, mountain high EDS system. If right. the batteries go out, yeah, you're. Yep. Um, so factors in this are the altitude you're at. I mean, the FAA limits. Does anyone know what the FAA requirements are for oxygen use? Say you. 
Um, it's been a while. I think it's uh, above above fourteen thousand. It's required for pilots, and no, that's wrong. Twelve thousand, and then fourteen five. It's required for passengers above thirty minutes. I don't remember. <laughs> no, you, no. you kind of were throwing around some numbers that are, are almost right, but any time above twelve thousand five hundred to fourteen thousand feet, you're allowed thirty minutes as a pilot in command. Above fourteen thousand, you have to have it on all the time, and passengers are above fifteen thousand. And yeah. that that's you know obviously easy to have happen in in, uh, in, in the mountains here. So if you have a you know, oxygen system failure, you're probably not going to be going cross country. You're going to just be flying low, but just as maybe more important is your, your personal limits. Um, most people I know have it set uh, with the system. It has 5,000 foot increments to come on no later than, than 10,000 feet that, that, that it starts giving you a demand. And I use that just kind of as my, you know, if, if I'm above 10,000 feet, I want to have oxygen. So if the system's failed, I'm, I'm again, I'm probably maybe just flying around very locally, but I'm not going to be going anywhere. Um, yeah, and the rule of thumb that I was always, that Armand always told me is basically if you plan on doing anything in the mountains, just have it on before you take off. Yeah, no, and that's, no that's you know, like that's pre-breathing oxygen and that just, yeah, yeah, keeps everything fresh and good to go and you're not waiting till uh, 10,000 feet. And, and there's really no reason not to. Yeah, I also like to turn it on to a lower altitude because I know it's working when I take off. And when I come back after a long cross country, it's nice to get a couple shots of oxygen before you land. Mm -hmm. And with the EDS system, it uses very little oxygen at low altitudes. Mm -hmm. It uses a lot more when you're at 17,000. But when you're at 6,000, eh, it's hardly using any. Right, agreed. Um, it would be great if we all knew our hypoxia symptoms. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of the euphoria thing that is generally talked about. The problem is, is that once you have euphoria, maybe you're not using good judgment and you're not realizing, oh, my, my oxygen tube came disconnected or, you know, the system just quit. I'm not feeling the puffs of air. And really the only way to do that is to, to do an altitude uh, chamber, which I'm sure there are civilian outfits that you can do that with, but that was a nice advantage being in the military is you got to really parse out what, what your initial symptoms were so that you would remedy it before, yeah, I start feeling really good and everything's great and now you're not going to make any good decisions. So I, I haven't heard, but I'm sure there's been cases where glider pilots have had pretty severe hypoxia and you know, maybe they didn't come to a, a bitter end because they, the bad decisions they made, they ended up coming, getting low and then uh, we're, we're okay. But it, we fly high a lot and uh, we're a non-pressurized aircraft. So hypoxia is, is a real potential problem. So we'll fly lower and uh, yeah, land if necessary. Uh, instrument failures, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, things there, but the basic instruments, you know, probably going to be a pedostatic plug or maybe uh, some wiring broken somewhere, you know, to your vario. Um, batteries trained, you know, the things that are electrical aren't going to work too well if there's no power. Um, glider not covered, I guess, you know, if your pedostatic tubes get plugged, so not having those covered up or having the covers on the aircraft could cause that, that to happen. Pre-flight, make sure that those those uh, ports are clear. It's uh, it's important, and make sure the batteries are charged before uh, before taking off. Um, so if you do now, have what's, uh, what, let's, there's another thing that can happen that causes your pedostatic tube not to work well, and we we've had this with the DG, um, mm -hmm. and that was if you don't set that uh probe in all the way it's easy to set it in part of the way and you think oh yeah it's fine but it pushes another eighth of an inch and that makes all the difference so make sure right. it's well seated yeah they, i think it makes your your airspeed just basically wonky right it just doesn't work work as it is advertised uh, well this has been more of a problem with the uh, uh total energy probe oh, oh okay 
Right. Yeah. And um, you know, you also mentioned that make sure your static vents are cl clear. You know, you, I used to think, oh, static air, oh, so what? Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. Well, if your static air isn't right, nothing is right. Yeah, so, you're, if, if your static ports are, are clogged, your altimeter will essentially freeze or at least read completely wrong. You know, it will not, it's, and same thing with your airspeed. Yes, your airspeed, your, your airspeed your start working like, right, yeah. start working like an altimeter instead of an airspeed indicator. The best thing to do in that case is if you if you know that they're not working right is if you can cover them up so you're not looking at bad information and go back to what you should have learned as you or will learn if you're not a glider pilot yet as you as you fly and that's to learn to fly by wind noise and feel and sight picture this pitch attitude should be a pretty good speed this pitch attitude i'm going to be a lot faster and that, hear that wind noise, you know, the, uh, the pitch of it and the, the amount of it and, um, you know, be able to maneuver the aircraft and land the aircraft uh, without uh, airspeed. When it comes to altimeter, if you land out, you probably don't know the exact elevation. So it's good to have a, a visual picture and perhaps practice it from time to time of not using the altimeter to use for landing, you know, to be able to land the aircraft without constantly, you know, looking at your altimeter. And for a very variometer, obviously we're not gonna be trying to go places if our variometer isn't working, but um, you can feel thermals, you know, see the pants type of feel. So if it's a matter of just getting back to where you can land, you know, trust, trust what you're feeling and, and and, and try to circle and, and, and you probably will be at least somewhat successful in, in thermaling. When it comes to your flight flight uh, computer, um, Fallon, it's always good to have a backup map of some sort, or at least, uh, you know, maybe you have a, an iPad or a phone app um, that you can use um, instead of just using your onboard flight computer. Uh, radio failure, be very predictable really have your head on a swivel if you're in the pattern if you're just flying out in the mountains really shouldn't make a whole lot of difference uh this is one that i threw in there because i happened to see a, a, a video on it um you know and i think it's also something that could happen pretty easily uh especially if you just are really always trying to stay as high as you can and that is Inadvertent IM, instrument meteorological conditions or IMC, you know, cloud suck, getting sucked into a cloud, or even I could conceive if we have enough smoke or, or haze here, uh, actually not just conceive, I think Mark Terry has an excellent story about that happening to him, where he, he just basically couldn't see the ground anymore. Um, low situational awareness, yeah, I mean, why are you going to get sucked into a cloud because you're not looking up, you're not monitoring your altitude, you're proximity to the clouds. The glider book answer or not the flight, uh, not the um, handbook, but flight manuals I've seen will say, you know, extend your spoilers and, and put the nose down. The problem with that is, is if you're in IMC conditions, you're going to start to lose positional awareness. And what's inevitably going to happen is you're going to end up in a graveyard spiral or spiral dive. So yeah, putting the spoilers out would probably help somewhat, but um, if you're in lift strong enough that you're not coming out of that cloud anytime soon and you get into a big enough spot dive, you could over G or, um, you know, go above red line in your aircraft. Yeah, this, so practical, may I interrupt here, from a practical standpoint, um, you know, pulling the spoilers when you're going fast, uh, you're gonna really you, your head's gonna be hitting the camera. You're gonna get really disoriented. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, uh, think of it, it's not just doing this when you you're you know if you're in the weather long enough, you are gonna get disoriented. The, the G forces and such are going to. The the interesting article I I saw actually was in SSA, Soaring Society of America um, podcast, and then they had a reference to the article that got published I think in Soaring Society of America. He's a really well-known, you know, extremely competent uh, cross-country pilot, 
Kempton Izunu. And this was what he wrote in here. And I, I you know, I can't, I've never done this and, and probably very few people have. So if you got sucked into a cloud and any, and any time you start hearing a lot of wind noise and you're not really knowing what's going on, it might be time to, to bail out as, as extreme as that may seem. But this was what he, he wrote and I just found it very interesting, but um, basically said if, if you, um, so my, my take is generally push over if you can see the ground and, and get down before you really get disoriented, but um, you'll most likely end up in a spiral dive over uh, extended time and that's due to those vestibular illusions. His, his points were, um, to gently roll one way or the other. So just roll the air, force yourself to move the stick and see if the noise that you hear decreases. The theory being that you're in a spiral dive and if you roll one way and it happens to roll you out of it and the noise doesn't increase, in other words, you don't go into a, a bigger dive because you're now no longer pulling with all those Gs, then roll the other way. You chose the wrong direction. <laughs> That will put you into an accelerated stall. So he's saying is that you'll be going so fast that the nose will pop up without you being able to basically stop it. And you'll go into an accelerated stall. So you'll pop up and the aircraft will stall. And then if you don't do anything else, eventually you'll end up going into a spiral in the same direction or another direction. So what he proposes is that, and he did this, he actually, he put it, the aircraft into a spin. So when it went into that stall, he kicked in a whole bunch of rudder and now he went into a spin and he basically just spun. Now the aircraft's not gonna overstress. It's just gonna spiral eventually down. And he came out of the cloud in a spin and then recovered from the spin. So it was more just, I was really thought, intrigued by the, the, that as a technique, um, if you get disoriented in the clouds because most likely you're gonna end up in some kind of a, a spiral dive. Now, I suppose if, if the lift isn't that high, maybe you'll spiral dive right out of the cloud before you overstress or overspeed the aircraft. But eventually, I guess, you know, that's what will happen in the spiral dive if you don't get out of it and get into a spin and then just spin out of the cloud. So take it for what it's worth. That's kind of my just, wow, what an interesting thing to read about. Can I, can I jump in for a second, Joe? Yeah. Um, obviously, this has never happened to me, and fingers crossed, it never will. Um, but just with with all the smoke and haze that happens here in Colorado, one thing I always try to make sure I have on me when I go flying is some sort of artificial horizon on my phone. Um, all your phones have accelerometers. You'll be able to get a really quick and dirty, you know, artificial horizon. So you have to hold it there. perfectly level. I mean, how do you hold the phone? Yeah, I use my phone as my flight computer, and so it's almost always mounted in the orientation of the cockpit. But I mean, for, for with regards of like what you were talking about, trying to discern which way is up and down, trying to avoid um, exceeding VNE, um, just holding it up to the dashboard will be enough to to show you which way you need to go. Okay, very interesting. And awesome. I know, awesome. I know some people who fly with LX navs that's built into your flight computer. Right. Yeah, I know it's an option to to buy it. You know, but yeah, you know. it's free on your phone. But yeah, none of our gl club gliders, and I don't know of any, well, I do know one individual owner that has a uh, an ADI, artificial horizon. Thank you. All right, landing anomalies, our last uh, topic. Uh, land out is a, a big one. I have some experience with this too. Uh, cause, obviously too low to make the desired place you wanna land, usually a runway. Why is that gonna happen? You run out of lift, maybe weather. Maybe you have to turn a significant way from where you were going to go and now there's no more lift that direction. Uh, a glider problem. So one of those, you know, if you had spoilers or something, you know, something happens with your glider or some reason that you're coming down or a miscalculated glide. You know, uh, you're saying, oh, I can make final glide and, and you uh, hit some sink. And now next thing you know, you're, you're, you're landing out. So you had a good plan, it just kind of fell apart. Remedies, so you're gonna land at an unplanned airport. That's what I've done a few times or off airport. Um, the same general procedures are applying in either case, obviously an airport that's a nice surface is, 
a little easier to uh, to manage the stress level on, but um, you're still kind of following the, the same thought process when it comes to uh, doing the land out. So key is stay aware of your situation at all times to maintain that situational awareness. What's the terrain that's around me? What kind of weather do I see? Am I, what kind of lift am I encountering? What the trends are? And you know where where are my outlanding possibilities? Uh, even uh, if you're at seventeen thousand five hundred feet, it doesn't take very long, especially in the mountains, before you're going, "Ooh, I'm I'm getting low." And so, just kind of knowing where, it, even in the best of times, where your uh, possibilities are to land is is a good way to is is the way to make sure that you uh, things go well. Make a timely decision to land out, you know, transitioning those priorities. So, um, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to find lift and, and okay, that didn't work. We're trying to find the next source of lift. As you're getting lower and lower into less hospitable terrain, start thinking more and more about where, where do I need to start working towards so that I have a better land out uh, um, possibility. And in all three of the cases where I did that, you know, that resulted in me maybe not going the best direction for where I knew that I had the highest probability of lift, but it meant that uh, the consequences were going to be a lot less uh, severe. If, if I went the other way, that I had a lot less um, possibilities for a successful land out. Planning ahead, again, knowing, you know, studying where you're, you're going, if you have a route, and just knowing as much as you can about the local local terrain or whatever terrain you're flying over, having that in your flight computer marked on a map. So being ready, having that, that knowledge and that preparation uh, part of, of uh, emergencies. Um, so as we're getting closer to realizing that we have a good possibility of landing out, start evaluating if you haven't already, specifically what the winds are doing down lower and what kind of terrain that you're looking at, what kind of obstacles that you're dealing with so you can pick better, the better areas to, uh, to be working towards. Generally drifting downwind is gonna give you more time to, more area to uh, evaluate because you know if you're drifting with the wind, you're able to look at more stuff without uh, descending as much. Um, you can discern the wind using lots of things, you know, smoke, dust, flags, trees, the, the um, patterns on lakes or ponds that you see below. Um, terrain features, things you want to be looking for as you're, as you're getting lower is the four S's, um, slope, surface, size, and stock. So slope, obviously we'd like to land as flat ground as possible, but if we do see a slope, uh, by far the preferable direction is going to be uphill surface you know obviously is it going to destroy my glider or is it going to be uh, a good surface to land on or, or something in in between the size of the the land out location and um you know primarily obviously the the length as it's oriented as much as into the wind but the, also the uh the width in case uh you know you're trying to angle across the field uh, to be more directly into the wind or uphill. Stock, um, landing where there are, or, or creatures can be bad uh, from the standpoint of hitting them, but secondarily, uh, cows especially, I guess, destroy gliders. They like to chew on gliders for some reason. Um, obstacles, you wanna look out for wires. If you see any kind of uh, electric pole, in a building or electric pole and another electric pole or even electric pole without something else, there's gonna be a wire going somewhere from that. So um, try to uh, avoid being anywhere near where there's pole, uh, electric poles. Fencing, uh, you know, long roads, along fields, you can look for discontinuities in color in the fields. That's usually a fence in there somewhere. And you can almost count on them being along most roads either that or poles. Trees, uh, obviously, uh, that's an obstacle you need to take into account. And buildings, obviously, obstacle that you need to take into account. 
by 2,000 feet above the ground, you should be have a good general area sighted. And you know these are obviously rules of thumb. I'm sure there's many pilots that have gone lower than that, and there's some that have gone higher than that and not had it work out. But over generally favorable terrain, 2,000 feet, specific location by 1,500 feet, and commit by 1,000. An interesting point I heard on the commit by 1,000 is, so you're probably trying to communicate, or at least that's what I did when I was landing out, make sure that somebody knew what was going on. 1,000 feet, you probably should turn your radio off and just focus on landing. So that's not the time to be talking to anybody anymore. Um, and then that's, you know, you, you need to say, okay, this is how I'm going to be flying my pattern and I am going to be landing. You know, this is my desired aim point uh, by a thousand feet because that's starting to be our normal pattern altitudes that we're familiar with. If you can fly a, a familiar rectangular pattern, do it. It's going to be easier for you to make all your judgments. Obviously, again, you're not going to have exact altitudes. You're going to be doing this by eye. If you can't, well, then modify as necessary. It's, it's better to um, try to adjust your base leg than to try to adjust your downwind. So don't try to fly downwind, 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 turn base. And I go, oops, I can't make it. It's better to actually overshoot your base and then turn back the other way and then do it. So kind of do an S turn on a base than to keep flying your downwind drill. You think you might have it perfect and then end up misjudging your glide. Uh, obstacles, a 10 to one rule. And I would say that's probably as a, as a minimum. I mean, if you really are confident that you can use the spoilers properly, a 50 foot tree, a 500 foot feet, uh, you're gonna be, I think I have that worded kind of wrong. You're, you're gonna need 500 feet beyond that tree to be able to uh, touch down, I think is the way to, to look at that. It's not really the field minimum, but a 50 foot tree, kind of your standard tree, you better have a field where you have 500 feet just to make it over that tree to touch down and then have uh, the space to actually roll out. Uh, land uphill. If you're on any kind of terrain, it's gonna be hard to see the, the direction of, of, of terrain uh, generally houses and things like that are going to be at the bottom. So if you're landing in a field and there's a house on one side and the other side's trees, you're probably going to be more likely to be landing uphill if it's in a hilly area, if you land towards the trees. Um, obviously into the wind is good. Be on speed. You know, don't try to fly super slow, but every five knots that you're faster is going to be a lot more. It's a square of your speed is your energy. So you're going to you're gonna travel a lot further um, on the ground once you touch down. So try to be really fly your best on speed landing. Uh, when it comes to surface conditions, you know, a fresh plowed field is probably gonna be good because there's probably not gonna be rocks in that. There's obviously not gonna be crops. Um, sometimes plowing can be, there can be big chunks of dirt. So it may not be the prettiest thing, but it's probably not gonna result in injury or maybe even substantial glider damage. If you do see crop lines, uh, you know, try to fly parallel to them, a crop circle. I've heard try to land towards the outer edges of it because there's less curves to that. You know, you're, you're getting more, less going across the uh, crop lines. Colors, um, but generally the browner is going to be the better, it, you know, if it is some kind of vegetation. Uh, it can be very deceiving from what I've read to know how tall things are. but if you can tell that it's corn, really, really try not to land in corn because it's it could be it could be more than just a glider damage. It could, it could flip your glider over and kill you. Maximum braking. You know this isn't the time to save the brakes. So when you touch down, just get on the brakes. If you're going to hit something solid that's going to hurt, ground loop it. Um, you know, in general, the way to do that is going to be roll the wing and push a little bit and it's going to hit this nose and hit its wingtip and it's just going to flip it around and if you're lucky you won't break the tail don't roll under fence wires they could guillotine you um you uh basically though it looks like it's going to hurt you want to aim for the uh the post if you're heading towards a, a fence and can't ground loop it before you get there and if you happen to decide you want to land in the water, 
you know, it's probably not a bad choice from the standpoint of having a predictable flat. You know, you're going to be able to touch down. Um, obviously, drowning is a, is, a, is a concern. The interesting thing is, is uh, the predominant wisdom is to have your gear down. You're not going to try to just skim along the water or something that that will actually make you nose. And so have your gear down. Anything to add on that, Armin? I know there's been a lot of uh, no, no. Uh, you covered a lot, and and no, I don't have. I mean, there's always something, but I mean, no, nothing of any significance. Yeah, this is another uh, sorting society. I think it was a sorting society in America that I read about off airport landings, and just a ton of really good information in it from someone that's done it a number of times. Um, so I don't know how these links will show up. Obviously not on the, the, the video, but if the slideshow makes it in there, they should be able to work. Okay, I think this is our last topic, emergency equipment and survival gear. Um, there was, again, there was a good SSA webinar on that. And I met the guy, a guy that, that was actually kind of hosting it and he had a, could have been fatal land out crash that having these emergency equipment including uh i think he had a, a a spot but camping versus survival so camping is you landed fine you have your backpack or whatever you use that you have clothing and food and maybe you bring a small tent or whatever survival is you had to bail out that's what you have carried on you so in your pockets that doesn't fall out of your pockets maybe zipped in or attached to your harness. So think of it those both those ways. There's, there's a huge difference between if you have to bail out versus you, even if you crash the ship and you have access to the, the stuff. Always try to carry the basics, you know, some, some kind of food, extra water, you know, not that you're drinking while you're flying, but that you have separate and clothing that'll protect you from sun, rain, cold. As we get into these months here, you know, there's already been snow in the mountains. So I dread the thought of if I had to bail out or land out way up in the mountains uh, because it's, it's a whole different situation to spend the night way up in the mountains in the cold. So as you, if you choose to fly in the mountains into the colder months, really be thinking more about that. But always be thinking about the food and water. Um, minimum survival kit, that's what I was saying as far as the survival versus the camping. Some cash, sun and bug repellent, some kind of multi-tool, first aid, uh, probably should have put on there your, your personal location devices. Um, another thing I've heard, you know, heard is an extra spare pair of glasses if you need reading glasses. Um, because whatever you had stashed in, in the back or if, you know, if you were wearing them, they're, they're probably gone if you had to bail out. Personal location devices. Again, this, this, uh, this link was really good on that, talking about the merits and the, all the different features of spot versus the Garmin inReach versus these other emergency uh, position indicating radio beacons that are available um, and all the different features of them. But suffice it to say, having one of them or all of them <laughs> is a good idea it's you may not have cell phone reception where you are or you may be in a situation where all you can do is push a button if you're injured um again uh, this uh website really good uh information on that all right my final thoughts uh, most accidents when we're talking about you know why things go terribly wrong or a result of some kind of a pilot error. Uh, Clemens had a good ground school where he parsed through all the, the glider accident summaries that he could find and went through what percentage, you know, a pilot error and what phases of flight. The other thing about accidents is, you know, usually one mistake doesn't result in an accident. It's usually a chain of type of events. So um, for what it's worth, Emergency most often doesn't mean an accident. So that's what I was just getting at. Uh, many most emergencies are pilot error. Using the checklist will eliminate a lot of those. So doing a good pre-flight, you're not gonna have issues with the glider as Armin talked about earlier. Continuously evaluate and minimize risk. And as 
become a more experienced aviator for those of you that aren't uh, aeronautical decision making. So is, you know, making continuous adjustments to what you're doing in the name of minimizing risk is the key. And I think it's really, really key in gliding. So not just haphazardly going off and then finding yourself in a bind, but you know, seeing what challenges you have, evaluating what you know about the situation, what, how good your glider is, what it can do, your experience and, and choosing your alternatives of what you can do to minimize those risks. Practice, even if just in your mind, abnormal and emergency procedures. So we used to call it chair flying in the Air Force. You just think about if I have this and going through and trying to get it kind of rote and, and thinking through the permutations of what could go on. And, and that way, you know, you're, you're just that much ahead of when it, when it really happens. Condor is an excellent asset for doing that. Uh, again, our president Clemens had a great um, Condor video of, of landing out at uh, Lemons Field or Lemons Field, um, um, Elliot's Field and the L-shaped field off of takeoff. You know, just practicing things like that are great. And use your instructor, you know, they can tell you there I was stories and tell you other people's stories. They're kind of a, a wealth of knowledge and, and mentored flying. Say you've done a great job of doing that. and You've got to experience someone being with someone that's experienced it, evaluating risk and evaluating uh, the situation and taking a lot of things into consideration that you might not have ever thought of. And I didn't, I, I don't know who Arnie J way more, but I, I know this quote well from flying. Superior pilot is one who stays out of trouble while using superior judgment to avoid situations that might require the use of superior skill. So developing judgment so that you don't have to use those finely honed skills to get yourself out of a bind. And that's all I got. Well, Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, let's go ahead and take this screen share off, if you would. Great, and uh, let's kind of look at uh, everybody here who's uh, involved. Um, and you know we've uh, we've kind of gone through a couple hours of this, which is which is plenty. But uh, does anybody have anything, either a question or, or just something to kind of discuss? Uh, we've covered a lot of a lot of ground here. Uh, the emergency thing. Uh, you know, it sounds like something you don't need until you really need it, and then you really need it. Um, you know, uh, so at any rate, uh, does anybody have uh, something that kind of intrigued them or want to discuss further that uh, on the emergencies that we we might face someday in uh, in gliders? Um, I was going to ask if there's. Uh, um something like a minimum altitude for billing out, for example. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the parachute guys will tell you that it takes 350 feet to deploy a parachute. So if you get out of your glider at 351 feet, you can still safely land on the ground. Now, a couple, uh, I have never, you know, I have never jumped out of an airplane that was at least reasonably good. Uh, you know, you keep hearing the thing about a perfectly good airplane. It doesn't have to be perfectly good. As long as it's reasonably good, I'd, I'd rather land than jump out. Uh, but uh, one thing that happens uh, when you get into a bad situation and you are going to have to bail out. The glider is going to be rapidly descending towards the ground. And um, you got to get out. And getting out may be hard, especially if the glider is in a spin. And you know, you're going to have more than one G that requires you to get out. Um, and you're going to lose a lot of altitude. Uh, but you know, if that does happen, you just have to I mean, you have no other choice. 
you have to struggle and do whatever you can to get out and certainly don't worry about kicking the panel or something because there's not going to be anything left once the glider hits the ground. So you've got to get out of that, that glider and you know, you've got to release the belts, not the parachute. So it's canopy. You got to get the canopy open. You got to get your belts off and then you got to get your butt out. So it's, uh, you know, it's called uh, canopy belt butts. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever released their parachute rather than the, than the, than the seat belt, but that's a horrible thought. So uh, you just, you got to do whatever you can. And if you get out above 350 feet, the parachute will uh, open and, and, and keep you from hitting the ground hard. I don't know if any of you guys um, look at a lot of um, podcasts or, or YouTube videos of gliding experts, but there's a guy named G. Dale. So it's just D. Dot Dale. And I saw a presentation he did in New Zealand. I guess that's where he's based out of. There was this, he had a personal experience of having a midair bailed out. And he talked through the stuff you're talking about, Armin. And it's like, you know, the disorientation, the, um, you know, trying to trying to extract himself from the glider, you know, and he basically said he got lucky and that it went negative and it kind of just, you know, he fell out of the glider under negative Gs. And, you know, just the whole pulling of the, uh, the rip cord and, and, you know, just, he actually said that he was uh, maybe unconscious for a little while too, because of the way the, the, the midair happened. So, you know, and that's the most likely situation that you would have to bail out would be a midair, I mean, by far. Um, the only other situation is one that Elliot Dickerson posed to me was if he was over such hostile terrain and he knew he was gonna be landing, coming down to the ground, he said he would think about bailing out versus trying to crash into like rugged, rugged mountain terrain. So I hadn't thought about that one, but that would, that would be a really hard decision to make. But at least in that case, you could control it. You know, you could decide what altitude, and, you know, the glider's not flailing all over the place. Most likely you're going to be in a, in a bad way. The thing's going to be spinning out of control. You know, it's going to be not, not flying predictably. When I was at uh, a uh, soaring camp in Utah, uh, I guess that was three seasons ago, um, there was a, um, an Air Force cadet who gave a talk on what had happened the year before. And he said he was flying in the backseat of a, uh, of a two-place aircraft. And the pilot in the front seat said, take your foot off the rudder. And he said, well, I didn't have my foot on the rudder. And then, you know, things were, the aircraft was uh, behaving very irrationally. And the pilot said again, take your foot off the rudder. And he didn't have his foot off the rudder. He didn't, you know, I mean, he totally hands off, to hands and feet off of the controls. Um, and then he said he saw the canopy open and the pilot in the front seat eject or, you know, get out. So he decided he better get out. Um, and uh, so at any rate, he, he bailed out. He landed. He said he saw a really good landing place, like on the top of this mesa. And uh, he comes down and he lands on the top of mesa and everything's fine. I guess he had had some parachute training in, in the Air Force Academy. Um, and he landed, everything was fine. But climbing down off that mesa was very difficult. Uh, it was very rugged terrain with lots of cliffs and it took him hours and hours to get down. Um, the other pilot uh, was injured uh, when he landed. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but he was hospitalized. Um, and so, you know, these, it can happen and this didn't happen this happened i guess in in you know previously uh in the flight uh, everything had been normal uh and then all of a sudden something happened to the rudder and the rudder stuck 
So uh, yeah, you may find yourself bailing out. I, I, I hope I never do. Uh, from what I've been told, the history of the club, uh, there's been one situation where there was a bailout. Um, and after inspecting the glider, uh, the pilot had kind of wished he had stayed with, with the glider. So it, you know, fortunately it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Uh, we do wear parachutes in the club uh, basically all the time. And um, we just, you know, it, it's like insurance. You buy it, you buy a parachute and you hope the hell you never use it. Um, I know there are some people who like skydiving. That's great. That's not my sport, but <laughs> if somebody wants to do it, go do it. But please don't do it out of one of our gliders. Uh, stay with the glider if you can. I think, um, you know, another you were talking about topics and, you know, if you heard um, um, Mark Terry's uh, landing at Rocky Mountain in the smoke yes, and haze. Yes, I have. Yeah, uh, that's, that's maybe a discussion for another day. Yeah, that was an amazing story. Yeah, um, there were some there were some errors there that. Oh, well, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you said, like I said, chain of events. Was... A chain of events, yes. Um, uh, so at any rate, we'll... I got an emergency a, a thing about, what do you guys think about reset and circuit breakers? Well, I mean, they're resettable for a reason. Um, I mean, I assume, Jason, that the, uh, you're talking about like a, a radio or a... Uh, or a computer or, or a variometer or something, one of those uh, circuit breakers yeah. went out? For me, I've always just kind of had the idea I mean, when we're flying for fun and we don't have any really required equipment to, to safely get her down, that you never reset a breaker in the air. Uh, but I, I, you know, this is kind of my, my philosophy towards it. And I, I'm curious what you guys are teaching and how we're what our plan is jeff go ahead you got a lot more experience with powered aircraft than I do. well yeah i mean jason does too but uh i mean the thing i always heard was we said it once and if it pops again i mean if it pops at all there's obviously something wrong but if it pops again you know circuit breakers to basically prevent the wiring from burning right the circuit breaker isn't really to protect the the radio I mean, it does protect the radio, but it's because you don't want that wire to over, just like in your house, you have 15 amps so that the wire doesn't burn up and then you burn your house down. So if you're resetting it continuously, just realize that it may not be, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do something to the radio. It's, it's you could start a, a fire and I don't know how high the voltage is, if that's a, or amperage is that that would be a factor in our gliders. Yeah, you know, a glider with with no generator, um, with no, you know, fuel, uh, it's just a battery. And, a, you know, I, I'd be a lot less concerned about resetting a, um, something that pops. But, you know, there's nothing really in the glider that you absolutely need to get the glider safety out of there. You Is Tango need, Romeo acting up again? It was having a problem. No, no, I'm no. All right. I mean, you can you can land a glider without a without an altimeter. In fact, uh, when you have students fly without the land without the altimeter, the landing goes a lot better because they're looking at the ground, not at the altimeter. Um, and then you know you really don't need the airspeed indicator either because you've got your ear, and if you're well trained on what sound you should be hearing when you're flying the right approach speed. Um, you don't need, you don't need that either. Um, everybody who lands without a, I shouldn't say everybody, but just about everybody I've seen who lands without an airspeed indicator comes in a little bit hot. And so they come in a little too fast and they use more runway and they have to push back, but Hey, that's no big deal. That's a lot better than stalling short. 
So, um, yeah, you, there's nothing that you need other than your eyes and your ears and your and your hand and your feet to uh, to land safely with everything gone and all the instrumentation gone in a glider. Bruno, um, Bruno Vassell, um, you're probably familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't um, discuss an incident where a young man was flying in a contest, and uh, the his uh, control stick broke off, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I. Um, I think they tried to get him to bail out, but in the end, I think he, uh, he th thought that he could land it uh, and, and ended up landing it without a control stick. Um, and, uh, but he just, he talks about that in one of his uh, YouTube, Bruno Vassal talks about it, either in one of his YouTube videos or one of the SSA webinar presentations that uh, that he's been involved in um, but uh, that's uh, just yeah we don't we don't train for that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> right so uh, I mean but, I, I know yeah, we've, was, had, we've had pilots at uh, at uh, the um, at the mile high gliding you know and you're in the back uh, you're in the back seat of the uh, 232 giving rides and that stick is held in the stick in the back seat and there's a, a screw in there and if it comes out you know you can pull <laughs> pull the stick out and you're like oops and you have to put it back in uh uh but uh you know that's not reassuring <laughs> no it's not reassuring it's not it's not a good thing to have happen but it has happened yeah, yeah. and uh, it can be put back in and even without the the safety screw in there it uh you can still land the glider. All right, well, I think this kind of concludes uh, this session. And um, thanks everybody for joining in. And, um, and a special thanks, of course, uh, to, uh, to Jeff uh, for putting this on. I, I think you all can really see that Jeff has uh, a tremendous depth of experience uh, being in the Air Force for uh, his his career and, and retiring from the Air Force, and now he has a uh, CFI double I and glider and uh, excuse me, in helicopter, and will soon uh, add a glider rating to that. Uh, he's very thorough. I I appreciate that a great deal. I am not thorough, <laughs> so it's great to have uh, Jeff and Casey go through this. And I think what we're going to have is a really good uh, library of. Uh, if somebody wants to really learn they, the, the glider flying handbook, they can watch this series. Um, so thanks so much, Jeff. Great job. And uh, if nobody has anything else, uh, we will uh, conclude ground school tonight. Thank thanks, you, Jeff. Thanks, Armin. Awesome. All right. Uh, then uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. I'll send out a uh, email on Sunday uh, when the next uh, ground school is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, but of course it'll be recorded so you can watch it uh, at your leisure, but we would love to have you on the live session. Thanks everybody and good evening. Bye. Thank you.